could any of those uh, people in the audience who are part of this next press conference please join the podium, including Coco? Um, can I just ask the technicians, how do I get this up on the screen? So uh, we're ready to start this press conference, um, which has been uh, organized today by the United Nations Environment Program with uh, partners who will become clear in uh, a matter of seconds. Thanks very much for coming to this press conference. My name is Nick Nuttall. I'm the spokesperson for UNEP and the acting director of uh, communications. Uh, we're here to launch uh, a new analysis of uh, historical climate trends in 17 countries in the Sahel and uh, West Africa region and the implications for natural resources, livelihoods, migration, and conflict. I hope you have a copy of the report. It's at the back, as is the press release in English and French. The report, there we go, uh, speaks for itself, livelihood security, climate change, migration, and conflict in the Sahel. It's uh, the result of a joint project by UNEP in cooperation with the International Organization for Migration, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, the United Nations University, and the Permanent Interstate Committee for Drought Control in the Sahil, that's C-I-L-S-S, -S, with the maps produced by the University of Salzburg. Let me introduce uh, the panel, which is a little thinner than we had expected. We don't know where our other colleagues are. Uh, but uh, I'm really pleased to have Professor Jakob Reiner. He's the Vice Rector of the uh, UN University in Bonn. And we also have uh, Coco Warner, uh, who is also with the UNU. Uh, and uh, let me begin by with a, a sort of presentation of the, an overview of the study. And then we'll invite the other uh, members to actually, oh sorry, you're Dina, there we go. We've got, we got Dina, that's fantastic. Dina Onesco of IOM, superb, very nice to see you. Victim of security, okay, great. Let's start with the, uh, the presentation. Okay, in 2008, there was a UN mission to the Sahil led by Jan Egland, who was then a special advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations and identified serious risks connected with the potential impacts of climate change, including its effects on migration and tensions in the region. And that was over increasingly scarce natural resources. UNEP was asked to further examine how changes in climate could contribute to existing vulnerabilities in the region, particularly among the majority of the population who depend on those natural resources for their livelihood. The study had two objectives, to analyze the region's historical climate trends, identify hotspots, and determine the potential implications for tens of millions of people. Secondly, to provide recommendations for improving conflict and migration sensitivity in adaption planning, investments, and policies across the region. The study treated climate change as a threat multiplier, in effect adding to the mix of existing vulnerabilities in the region such as population pressures, environmental degradation, and weak governance. Those are the objectives. They're there. Then we have the methodology. So, nine Sahelian countries represented by CILSS determine the core of the study. Burkina Faso, Cape Verde, Chad, the Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, and Senegal. Then, because this is of a transboundary nature, uh, there were eight neighboring members of the Economic Commission of West African States, ECOWAS, included, and that was Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Guinea, Liberia, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Togo. The total population of these countries is around 309 million people. 
the report has analysed regional trends in temperature rainfall droughts and flooding over the last forty years and looked at their implications for migration and conflict from the atlantic coast to chad. the maps are an innovative feature which i'll show in a minute and they were produced based on the best available data. the areas vulnerable to sea level rise were also mapped. in addition more than one hundred pieces of research were reviewed. that's the study area and you can see that the cilss countries are outlined in red. i hope you can see that but it's certainly in the report anyway. there's a lot of poverty as you may imagine there and development is low. an estimated fifty percent of the region's population get their income from agriculture. seasonal migration by pastoralists and other livelihood groups has existed in this region for centuries. okay so floods. the first layer shown on the map in light blue indicates areas experiencing major major flooding which had seven or more floods over the twenty four year period between one thousand nine hundred and eighty five and two thousand and nine. the study found that the frequency of floods and the area covered by flooding has increased in parts of the region over this period. for example with large areas of southern burkina faso western niger and northern nigeria experiencing up to ten floods. this has meant less recovery time for farmland and pastures between flood events resulting in increased risk of deaths, massive population displacement and the loss of crops and cattle. droughts. okay so the orange area is where they have experienced six or more seasonal droughts over the twenty seven year period studied from eighty two to two thousand and nine specifically large areas of chad mali mauritania and niger have experienced recurrent droughts. precipitation rainfall the next map shows changes in precipitation over a thirty six year period from one thousand nine hundred and seventy to two thousand and six. the areas that have seen an increase of one hundred millimeters or more over that period in rainfall are marked in dark blue. the areas where precipitation has decreased by fifty millimeters or more are shown in light red. looks like pink to me but i think that's the one isn't it? yeah and that's the situation in the southern coast of ghana uh... and burkina faso and the ghana border. temperature okay this area uh... this 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 map shows areas that have seen an increase of more than one degree celsius in temperature they're in dark red and in far eastern chad and northern mali and mauritania there's actually been an increase of between one point five degrees c and two degrees c okay hot spots now so all those parameters that were mentioned were basically analyzed together to pinpoint areas that have seen the greatest cumulative changes you can see a white to red color gradient that identifies the intensity of the changes experienced from this analysis we've identified nineteen climate hot spots where climatic changes have been the most significant and which warrant focused adaptation planning and other follow up activities many of the hot spots are in the central part of the sahel in niger burkina faso northern and coastal ghana as well as northern togo benin and nigeria common to these hot spots is that they've been most heavily affected by flooding although they've always also experienced slow onset changes in particular temperature and the occurrence of drought so these are in a sense the priority areas and you may remember some years ago the intergovernmental panel on climate change was being asked a lot by governments well this is all great to have the global kind of assessments but we need to bring this more down to fine detail in a sense it's responding to that that interest of governments okay so the conclusions are there have been changes in climate over the past forty years the impacts of these changes on the availability of natural resources is 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 one factor and combined with factors such as population growth environmental degradation and weak governance has in overall led to greater competition over scarce resources and to changing migration patterns in the sahel and west africa the livelihoods of millions of people who depend on natural resources have been impacted and in particular food insecurity from herders to fodder merchants to sorghum and millet farmers and I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to basically uh, go to uh, 
Jakob, who is going to present a little bit more flesh on these findings, but also give us the key recommendations at the end. Thank you. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, good morning also from my side here in uh, Durban. I'm uh, very glad uh, to be uh, uh, able to uh, give you uh, further information on this study. The UN being the uh, UN University being the academic arm of UN uh, is very happy to uh, be partnered in this indeed I think uh, quite unique study. Why is it unique? Uh, it makes uh, climate change record over the last 40 years, uh, regional specific climate record. Now this is not uh, unique, this has been done for other, uh, for other uh, regions, but what is unique I think is that uh, it gives a connection uh, to the uh, availability of natural resources, livelihood, migration and conflict. What are the key findings? Uh, you have basically just heard them. Uh, temperature is increasing between one and two degrees depending on the sub-regions. Floods uh, have incurred uh, more frequently during the last uh, 24 years. Droughts have been recurrent and severe since uh, 1971. Over uh, 62 million people in the region uh, have required emergency assistance to, due to drought. Rainfall is increasing on average, but in detail shows a very complex pattern making a future prediction uh, very hard, actually. This is one of the, of the basic uh, uh, aspects we have to take account of when we uh, think about planning uh, ahead. The models are actually contradictive, sometimes not only uh, concerning the rate, but even the sign uh, of the change of the uh, uh, precipitation. Sea level rise uh, will be a problem for several of the coastal cities, uh, including Accra or Nouakchott, for example. Now, uh, Nick has uh, told you that uh, we have uh, selected 19 hotspots. Uh, Common uh, to these hotspots is that uh, they are almost all uh, strongly affected by uh, flooding. Moreover, they also have experienced uh, slow onset changes, in particular, as was said, temperature, uh, temperature changes, degradation of soils. One of the very important aspects on the whole is that 80% of the people in the region uh, are depending on natural resources in a direct way uh, that makes their life and more than 50% of the people are making their lives from natural resources, mainly uh, relying on agriculture. This goes together with an increase in population, increase rate in population of 3%, meaning statistically a doubling in less than 25 years. What does this mean for security? The competition for freshwater, coastal resources and land among fishermen, farmers, pastoralists, as well as new migrants is increasing, in some cases leading to tension and conflict, as for example uh, in the areas surrounding the Lake Chad. More generally in this analysis uh, underlines how competition between communities for scarce resources, especially land, water and forests, is, rea is already reality in West Africa, and that regional cooperation will be key to diffusing tensions. What does it mean for migration? Three different types of migration or main behavior, behavioral trends can be distinguished. First of all, southward migration to cities and coastal regions. Environmentally induced migration caused by rapid onset disasters such as flooding and conflict over fertile land and water resources being a more slow onset gradual change. What kind of recommendations uh, does the report make? Can I just have the slide, please? Just have one, yeah. that last yeah. slide up there. Yeah. There is one slide we have. So I will not just go uh, through systematically. Uh, you can uh, read them. Uh, Adopt adaptation policies that are migration and conflict sensitive, uh, not just concentrate on the climate change and the, and the variation of the climate parameters. Uh, the question is there more water uh, or less water alone, but also uh, take the impacts into account right from the beginning. 
base national adaptation strategies in green economy and promote the creation of green jobs. Just referring again to national, uh, there is one word uh, which we should add is international. Uh, international cooperation, regional cooperation is very important. Uh, the very important rivers like uh, the river Niger do not stop at the boundaries. Take a regional approach in addressing climate change, mitigation and conflict. Climate uh, migration uh, streams of people may not stop at the boundaries as well. Strengthen preventive actions, resource rights and dispute resolution. resolution. Prioritize systematic data collection and early warning systems. Uh, this includes uh, building up maintaining uh, climate observation systems, which is a prerequisite actually to really refine the regional prediction capabilities, to escape the problem which I mentioned before, that we at the moment uh, in many cases do not even see uh, the sign, does it go upward or upward with the uh, regional precipitation. Uh, for this, we need to have good uh, measurement and observation systems also being a very important ingredient into early warning. Early warning, uh, whatever uh, we will decide in detail on how to mitigate the risks for people, early warning will play a very important role. The study should be followed by uh, additional assessments uh, hot in the hotspots identified by this study. Uh, this is the first uh, uh, beginning, 40, 40 years is a long term in, 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 in the sense of uh, recording data series, but a short period in the, in the sense of doing climate analysis. So uh, this study should just be a first step. And as a final comment, we should use conflict and mitigation a risk to prioritize investment and to build donor commitment, long-term com uh, donor commitment uh, in the engagement in, Sa in, in Sahel. And the very last comment, uh, we have to take care of education of the people. Whatever the details of the problem are and whatever the details of the prediction uh, of the further development are, this problem will not be solved by our generation alone. Uh, we have to include the next generation right from the beginning. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks very much, Jacob. Um, so, Diana, uh, would you like to make some remarks? Great. Yes, thank you very much. I would like, in fact, to, to, to make four uh, messages, to pass on four messages related very specifically to the migration dimension of this report. Um, being coming from the International Organization for Migration, a partner in this uh, uh, report. So first of all, uh, I just wanted to highlight that the report is very innovative just by the fact that it creates some kind of a common language between communities that are extremely different, the climate change community, the security uh, and rights community, the migration community, and the development communities. And just the fact that we have these voices together trying to find a common language to express themselves, it's already a big step. We need this community of action and of pooling of resources. The second message I want to, to pass on on migration, it's um, that climate change already impacts on migration and that it will continue to do so. And the report highlights this very well in many different areas, in particular only the fact that we consider that there will be over 3 million people impacted by sea level rise, it, human mobility can be one of the important responses to this fact in the future. My third uh, message today, it's that in a way we use a lot the word uh, migration, which comes quite handy to us. Uh, it's an overall concept, but behind migration, we hide quite a lot of number of realities. And the report also highlights this very well, the complexity and the diversity of what migration means. For instance, the report shows that there is this very traditional way of migration, the pastoralist ancestral method still exists, but there are also very new trends, like people going permanently settling in cities and not moving back. That's an important change. And what matters more, all the more is that they go to cities that are already unsustainable 
from uh, a development point of view on the long term and who will be places that are among the hotspots. Um, we also speak about internal and international migration. I think it's important to highlight that because when we speak of internal, it, might, it will impact in different ways than international migration that needs, for instance, that some legal frameworks are in place. And the report is extremely interesting from this point of view as well because it shows, for instance, the example of the ECOWAS um, migration type of arrangement of agreement. And when we talk of migration, we talk also of a continuum from forced forms to voluntary forms. The most common form of, of the forced uh, migration is displacement, and the report shows how hard the hit the region is in this domain. For instance, 2007, Ghana, over 300,000 people displaced due to floods. And what matters is that migration can be nevertheless a voluntarily step if it's well planned and managed. And thus my fourth and final uh, message today is that the report shows very well that migration can be part of the solution. It can be part of the adaptation. It can be part of the adaptation strategy. And how to do this concretely, it's one of the key recommendations uh, of the report in terms of migration. It's the idea that migration uh, issues should be mainstream, integrated, added in, in all adaptation strategy plans. Because at the end of the day, we speak, of course, of adaptation when we speak about migration. We speak also about development, sustainable development. And one of the key uh, remarks of this report, in my view, is to show that those who are most vulnerable to climate change are very often those who are the most disadvantaged populations. And in fact, they are the ones who are maybe the ones who have the least chances to migrate. Thank you. Thanks very much. OK, so uh, we have uh, a very short time left for Q&A. But uh, uh, Koku, do you want to come join us uh, as a resource person? Now, uh, can you uh, say who you are and where you're from if there are journalists with uh, questions? Yes, I know that one. That's Fred Pierce from New Scientist. Is there a roving mic? Yeah. Fred Pierce, New Scientist. Um, I don't want to sound like a climate skeptic, but I'm wondering how much of what you're seeing is natural variability and how much is um, you can ascribe to climate change. And I suppose that matters if you're talking about hotspots. Do you have any feeling that the hotspots of the last 20 or 30 years will be the same as the hotspots in the next 20 or 30 years. So is your discovery of hotspots useful at all? Um, just to add to that, is, is the flooding due to climate change or increased rainfall, or is it due to dams and other things? Do you have a thought about that? Seems fl flooding seems to be one of the main issues you raise. Yeah, you're, you're raising a good point. I said that uh, 40 years of, uh, of data recording is a, is a long time and a big effort, and yet in, uh, in, in, in climate change analysis, it is a short time. So this is why I say that this is a, this is a, first, uh, a first step which must be followed by a real long-term uh, data collection. And I think what this uh, first analysis certainly shows is, 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 is the scope on, on the, in which this, this data collection has to go on. Uh, about uh, whether the present floodings uh, are uh, closely related to climate change or not, we cannot make a firm, we cannot give a firm answer. Uh, there are some hints that it is, but uh, as I said, the details of the precipitation patterns are very complex. And how complex they are, you also see when you look at the prediction of different models, which, uh, as I said, uh, in many cases do not, even, do not even agree in sign, actually, whether it, uh, there is a decrease, a local decrease or an increase. So your point, point is a very valid one, but I, in my opinion, this does not diminish the value of the study in the sense that it, I, I think it is quite the perfect uh, start for, uh, for, 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 for how to go on. I mean, I think what it does, Fred, is, I mean, it does certainly show that the region has experienced, um, you know, changes uh, in climate during the study period. I mean, it's certainly, now whether it's uh, natural variability or whether it's anthropogenic, uh, 
on top of it. It is silent on that fact, but it certainly shows the climate is decidedly changing in this 40-year period. And you can decide whether you just take that information and sit on it, or whether you use that information in a precautionary way to actually intervene. Take another question, then? Gentleman here on the front. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I am Ben Wasa from uh, CDC in West Africa. We have some problem to join the Zoom conference and also to get in touch uh, with you before uh, uh, this uh, conference. But I, I would like to, to ask you uh, uh, some question. Uh, have you in your uh, work reported uh, the relationship between uh, uh, migration and uh, regreening of, uh, of the soil in some part? Uh, I don't know if you have uh, well understood my question. Okay. There is some greening going on in the Sahel, isn't yes, there? And you and want to know the the how is that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anyone like to take that? I'll attempt to address your question, but I think there are other experts in the room that are very expert in this, and you may reach out to them afterwards. Um, but when you talk about regreening in the Sahel. I understand your question as being the possibility or the actual fact that some areas of the, the Sahel may, on average annual basis, receive more rain, while others may receive less. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Um, in that case, I think one of the observations of our report, and an area, again, referring back to the previous conversation where we need more information, is to understand the distributional impacts of things like rainfall on human society, and migration is one indication of population dynamics and effects of climate change on human society. So one thing, water certainly draws people. Again, referring back to things like dams, where water is available, you have livelihoods, and that can draw people because people are in search. A lot of, of mobility has to do with people's search for dignified, safe, stable livelihoods. So in the future, that's definitely a trend to keep an eye on. If some areas become more green, will people tend to go to the work towards those areas? Another question that comes up is, and this is a scientific debate, are areas greening? Do they receive more rainfall, or do they receive more intense rainfall in shorter periods of time? How usable is the rainfall that people have? We've observed through um, participatory research in the Sahara area, Area in, in conversations with Met Office and affected people and communities, they'll often observe that rainfall happens very intensely in short periods of time, followed by longer, more intense drying periods. And what farmers reflect on is this kind of water is not very usable for their livelihoods. So those are just two things you may keep, um, keep in mind. And of course, we very much appreciated the partnership with SEALS on this report. Thank you. Right. Anybody else? Yes, thanks. Hi, just Preet Kinder from Irin News. My question was also related to the robustness of the findings, um, I mean, considering the fact that you looked at, uh, uh, you know, climate change terms, very small, um, small, short period of time, the data that you study. Was it because you didn't have access to good sort of weather data? Uh, what was the problem? Mm -hmm. yeah. Who'd like to say that? Yeah, it was uh, it part, part of the data, actually, you have, uh, and you see some in the report, actually, part of the data actually uh, uh, cover a longer period, but uh, many of the data you indeed have only in, 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 in good quality only since, uh, since short time, since this relatively short time. So that was one of the main uh, uh, reasons to restrict to this time. And yet... Uh, we feel that you cannot just draw as a consequence to say nothing. I mean, you have to, you have to begin to build up the, the knowledge and to do the analysis. And I think in this sense, even uh, around the short, uh, during the short time, I think uh, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, a collection of, uh, of a lot of good data together. And we're just being told to wind up, but if you have a quick intervention, Dinah. No? Okay. Uh, sorry, we've run out of time. You know, these are 30-minute press conferences, and you have to go like the clappers, so uh, we've come to an end. Thanks very much. Bye.
Morning, everybody. Oh, this is working? Yes, it is. Morning, everybody, and very welcome to a short IUCN press briefing on adaptation. I think you've probably heard that there's been a lot of attention paid to adaptation here at the negotiations in the Nairobi work plan, plan in Subster, etc. And there's been a lot of attention paid in side events. But I just want to try and sort of unpack this term adaptation for you and what it might, what it means a bit more in practice and give you some examples, etc. Many of us, when we talk about adaptation, are more used to having the formal hard solutions, if you will, the dikes, the dams, the brick walls, etc., etc. But I think it's really important that we also start looking at nature-based solutions, natural solutions. For example, forest restoration, sustainable catchment management, agroforestry, etc., etc. Quick example. We're in Africa. The Horn of Africa was hit by probably the most devastating drought on record. Many, many people have died and many, many more have migrated, have moved. Drought is a natural phenomenon in Africa. The fact that drought proceeds to famine is as a result of either political failure, i.e. a failed state of Somalia, or policy failure of one form or other. And this brings us some of the people who live in the most risk-prone parts of the world, like the Horn of Africa, are also some of the people who are best equipped to adapt to climate change. They have very detailed risk management strategies. And they have ways of promoting resilience. Now, I don't know how many of you are aware of understand what, what resilience is all about because some people make it a very complex arrangement. I liken resilience to a very simple a rubber band. If we stretch the rubber band so far, it'll go back to roughly its same position. But if we pull it too far, you've still got the rubber band, but it's now very different. It's changed its state it's moved to something else. So resilience is that ability to come back and deliver similar goods and services. Once the resilience is broken, it moves to a different state. And that is very fundamental in, in climate change adaptation because many systems are being pushed to a slightly different state. Example again, Mount Elgon, Uganda. March this year, extreme rainfall event, huge landslide, 40 or 50 people killed because of an extreme rainfall event, event which is one of the things that uh, is characterized in climate change. We are going to get more extreme events. Here is one of them. It killed 40 people. How can we help those systems to adapt. And here, one thing they started to do, not this year, but in another place in the same area, they started last year to build simple but robust terraces, which is more of a hard adaptation. But equally, they were planting trees, they were planting grass strips around their, their lands to stabilize the, the farms. And there's a similar example is one farmer said, ah, I'm not going to do this terracing stuff. Three months later, his own potato farm slid about 50 meters down the hill. The next day, he started putting up his terraces. So ecosystem adaptation is linked on two real areas. One is risk management. And again, it's not a complex thing. Insurance policies do it all the time. You do it. We all do it all the time. We spread our risks. I don't have my insurance just in one company, and insurance companies don't have their 
uh, all their policies in one investment. They spread risks. So do land users. In dry lands, for example, livestock herders will split their livestock between different forms of stock, like camels and goats who browse on trees, cattle and sheep who eat grass. Equally, they will divert, have diverse agricultural options. And perhaps more importantly, they will have very detailed knowledge and institutional systems about use of wild tree products in particular. Because in the dry times, in the dry landscapes, tree products are more important than probably anything else put together because they yield longer. If you have one place I was with, the Turkana pastures in northern Kenya, they had detailed knowledge about what things they could use in the wet season, in the dry season, in drought times, extreme drought, and then they said, if it's gone beyond that, well, we're dead, or we have to move. So there's a whole range of ecosystem options, a whole range of societal options that we can learn from and build for climate change adaptation. Let's get a bit more real, because I heard in the last session somebody, Fred Pierce, was talking about how do we know that this is not just standard variability, the standard cycle of wet and dry? The, re the real truth is we don't yet accept to say that things are changing. But a little example. Nepal. I know not, one that, not in Africa, but I was there about three or four weeks ago, and the farmers half at about, ooh, probably about 2,500 meters up in the mountains were saying, our potatoes are all dying because it's too hot, i.e. the temperature and t temperature increase is happening there. The temperature started to increase, potatoes started dying. What are we going to do about it? That's nearly real climate change. They also said that their whole cropping calendar, i.e. when they plant and when they harvest, etc., and when they plant different species, has changed. So, for example, instead of planting in... Um, April or May, they may now have to plant in July and August. Those are real things happening. Underneath this, though, we need to have simple baselines to assess the vulnerability of, of people so that we can measure change in time. And that's one thing that differentiates ecosystem-based adaptation from past business as usual. Yes, we need to do business as usual. We need to continually continue with sustainable management of ecosystems, of agricultural lands. But that's not enough. We now need to have baselines to show what we need to do incrementally. That example from Nepal or from Uganda. How do we help make the lands more resilient? How do we help make the people more resilient to manage those lands? And those are key, key aspects. Uh, I'm going to mention a few things that IUCN is involved with. We have one partnership with, U, with UNEP and UNDP called the Mountain System Ecosystem-Based Adaptation Program. And it's working in, and this brochure is back there, working in Uganda, Peru, and Nepal to look at, look at exactly this sort of interface. Set the baselines, set some of the methodologies in place, and pilot EBA-related activities. And ecosystem-based adaptation activities include community-based adaptation, include respecting rights of local people and indigenous peoples, and learning and building on their indigenous systems, but making the direct links to ecosystems, land use, and agriculture. So that's one program that may actually expand a lot especially given some of the content and emphasis that we've heard in the last, last week, certainly, here at COP. So that's, secondly, we have another network with WWF, Care International, and the International Institute for Environment and Development. And that's interesting because it's bringing together, and both these partnerships are bringing together environmental, 
agencies with development agencies and that helps work both through some of the livelihood based issues as well as some of the conservation based issues i'm not going to talk for too much longer so i hope you have some questions the other part we there has tended to be a separation between adaptation and mitigation maybe that's administratively nice and tidy but when you get down to a community level it's definitely not so tidy because communities rural people adapt and mitigate at the same time so we've really got to start seeing how we can get adaptation and mitigation to complement each other forest restoration is an example of that secondly this te has tended to be an either or argument between should i build stone walls dams and dikes or should i restore forest manage the landscapes more sustainably and the reality is it's not an either or it's often and we can use natural solutions to complement hardware solutions again an example that i heard here the other day in south africa there was a dam built i can't remember i don't have the names of it here there was a dam built and they had the life expectancy of the dam was say 15 years because they were anticipating siltation blah 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 but there was a reserved area upstream from the dam and as a result that dam is expected to the lifespan of that, that dam is now expected to be 20 30 years much much longer because there has been ecosystem catchment management upstream and it's those sorts of combinations that are potentially really important for the future not looking at the either or but looking at the complementarity and synergy between them all over africa there is a massive emphasis on building infrastructure roads in particular to, to put people more in touch with each other most roads result in increased runoff and guess what increased degradation can we not put in simple structures upstream from the roads to improve the catchment protection functions so that when the road is constructed there's not so much water flowing downstream and causing degradation and i understand this is a both a problem here and i understand it's a very serious problem in many parts of china as they expand their road infrastructure so in many respects we need in sort of an iucn call we really need to focus much more on adaptation we're starting to get some serious examples about what ecosystem based adaptation means in practice and i've alluded to some of them here there are other examples from some projects in africa many some of you may have seen a film on climate change and development that iucn have produced with the governments of tanzania zambia and mozambique and funded by the finnish government so there are examples we are demonstrating here in this in this con conference but there are many other examples out, out there we can build on our call is really to we need to embrace some of these ecosystem approaches because they also bring co-benefits while adapting to climate they can put more food on my plate while adapting to climate change they can also increase the resilience of the ecosystem and that really is central to our iucn work in adaptation whether it's related to marine systems water catchment systems dryland areas or wherever And that's why some of our emphasis and we have a position paper out there at the back is a call for action based on adaptation lastly i'll just go back to the dry lands again because that's where my own practical experience i spent many many years working in dry lands we've tended to look at often fairly what i would call silver bullet type approaches to adaptation we need to get into much more detail of understanding of how people in these landscapes adapt anyway 
the knowledge the detail knowledge systems they have and they're not going to tell you or me in one day all the detail knowledge and institution systems but it's that detail that we need for the future and with that i'll open up for some questions and interrogation yes and could i ask you name and who you represent yeah my name is joy deep gupta i work for the third pool uh, yeah uh, you, you just spoke about the need to put much, much more focus on adaptation. How do you expect poor country governments to do that when there's hardly any money in the adaptation fund? Agree, there's not much money in the adaptation fund, but there's a lot more monies, I would suggest, being bilaterally um, dealt with or negotiated between different countries. Also, I, do, I don't think actually adaptation demands a huge amount of more, um, no, it, it can, if we can refocus some of the existing funding that going, say going to sustainable development and put an adaptation lens on it, i.e. let's have a vulnerability assessment, see why the potato farmers in Nepal are, the potatoes are dying and to sort of start suggesting other ways of doing business. So that's one part. The other part, if we do good adaptation work, we'll actually put more money into people's pockets, we'll help reduce poverty and improve livelihoods. So I think there's a, a, a multiple win in there. But the bottom line is I think there's going to be need for, there will be need for increased amounts of monies in an adaptation fund. But there are ways of doing it, building on existing funding, probably from outside of, of the climate change, but more in the normal development works and also from bilateral people, uh, bilateral things happening. You know, the, like this, this work here is being funded by the German government and, and there are other fundings like that happening. Yes, just, go. Uh, just wait for a little to do that. Hi, my name is Sarah Wild. I'm from a South African publication called Business Day. The, thing, the technologies you're talking about are very localized. It's an individual solution to an individual problem. How can you upscale that? Because what will work for potato farmers in Nepal might not work for China or for Africa. Is there some kind of database of if you have these certain kinds of problems, these are possible solutions? Thank you very much. You ask exactly the question that I'm trying to grapple with myself. Um, we're trying to slowly develop up examples of it. It's not in a database yet. There is, there is a database in the Nairobi work program of some of the examples. You've probably seen that publication. But I think that needs to be tremendously enriched, and it will be in the coming, coming times. But some of the principles out there I don't, I can be expanded widely. Another little example, northern Tanzania. 25 years ago, before things like climate change was talked about, EBA was not a word, nor was CCA, nor any of these things. The people in one region of that area, uh, in, in a, about 20 year period, restored because they wanted the goods and services of forests, about half a million hectares of forest across 750 villages. Every single farmer having little patches themselves, women's groups having patches. Now, I'm not saying that that's adapting to climate change, but it's them adapting to risk, because they said we've lost the goods and services that trees gave us. We want those goods and services back, and that helps them spread risk. Now, we might now have to retweet that to look at if climate change is happening, what else do we need to do? But some of those broad categories of um, strategy are there, restoration of forest, Mang well, you've probably heard about mangroves, and, um, mangrove restoration, mangrove management to mitigate flooding, etc. Riparian catchment conservation. Those are area, things that can be done, in, fr from my perspective, ac nearly across the board. Obviously, we have to make context spe specific and also owned at a local level, not, not something that big government agency says, you will plant X, Y, and Z, but having that local 
community based ownership and that was why it was successful that restoration was successful in tanzania it wasn't because government forced them government facilitated a process to take place that now doesn't need government it's going on itself and it's spreading to other regions in tanzania so there are some basics some basic tools out there but i think we need to expand the data set we also need to expand the different types of adaptation we can use for different sorts of areas and i'd hope in the next two or three years we'd be able to enrich that database hugely because there's a lot in the last year alone there's a phenomenal amount of stuff coming out help you any other questions yes I, I, Ida from Kyodo News. Can you say something about the possibility of ecosystem-based adaptation in developed countries like Japan and you and US? Well, I'm, personally, I have more experience of risk management and this sort of stuff in, in Africa. Um, I, know, I, know, I know from where you're asking that question. <laughs> My own, my, this is my own personal feeling. Is some of the natural solutions, ecosystem solutions, can cater for certain types of events. But I doubt if any ecosystem solution is really going to cater for the sort of event that you had, the tsunami, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you had this year. It's just too big. You may have to, no, I'm not sure. I'm not sure even if a brick wall, a big concrete wall would work. But there are... But I, I even think in, in developing in developed countries, let's get away. Um, there's many places where monocropping has been very impo very important as an agricultural way. Can we not learn from the potato famine in my own country 150 years ago, where I Irish people monocropped potatoes? Four million people, two million people died, and two million people emigrated when the potato famine struck. So I think there's plenty of opportunities out there. And in fact, there's actually opportunities to learn from countries like Africa, how we do multi-cropping, how we do agroforestry, et cetera, how we integrate land use. Right, one last question, and then I'm going, I've been told by the organizer that I have to shut up. Okay, thank you very much indeed, everybody. Hope it's been useful. <laughs>